Welcome to Map Crow, the RPG art show. My name is Kyle, and today we continue our world building series by fixing your factions. This video is brought to you by the generous sponsorship of World Anvil, and we will talk about them a bit later. Now, it should come as no surprise to you that as an artist, I am a visual thinker, so I'm going to draw a relationship map to keep track of who all of our factions are, and what they have to do with the central location of our adventure. Now, factions are more than just a collection of NPCs that dress in matching outfits. Factions are groups of characters that share a similar goal. They have the collective power to affect change in the world around them. What they want and what they will do to get what they want tells us about the world, and it tells us about the playable space and the themes of the game you're going to play. More than almost any other feature of world building you can spend your time on, Factions help your world seem three-dimensional and lived in, so it's really worth your time to get your factions correct to begin with, make them motivated and capable. I find it very useful to think of factions as characters in a scene together, and follow David Mamet's advice from his book On Directing Film, where he says, Every scene should be able to answer three questions. Who wants what from whom? What happens if they don't get it, and why is this happening now? Now, cliches in fantasy adventures are oftentimes the whole point of playing a game like Dungeons & Dragons. We enjoy those cliches, but there are some cliches that I think lead to some pretty flat experiences. So probably the worst thing that you can make any of your factions want is power. Because power is not a goal, it is a means to a goal. Same thing for wealth or violence. These things are only valuable to characters and factions because they are the means of change. Change towards what? That is the thing that your faction wants. But enough generalities, let's talk specifics. Let's build out some sample factions around a sample setting. The most bog standard sample setting you can have, a big old dungeon underground. So our first faction is probably going to be, who built this big old dungeon underground? Are they still kicking around? What are they up to? What do they want? What's their deal? We'll call them the, the Sentimane Elves, because they're from the city of Sentimanus. Yeah, and maybe, maybe they've been long dormant or destroyed uh, for thousands of years, and they ruled over the world um, back in the days before the sun was first created by the gods to drive them underground, because they had rebelled. That's it. That's it. So the Sentimane Elves must have rebelled because the gods were creating uh, more people than just them, and they became jealous and scornful, or probably fearful. They were no longer the center of the whole universe. They were no longer the main character of this plot, so they decided to change that, and that is when they turned their great power and wisdom towards the domination of all creation. And where did they find their great power? Well, they must have gotten it from somewhere to challenge the gods. So let's invent some kind of like elder thing. We'll call it uh, Codus after one of the hundred handed gods of Greek mythology. And in fact, let's just plagiarize the whole backstory for Codus wholesale from mythology and say that he was cast down by uh, the major gods. And that is why it sought to revenge itself upon the gods through the Sentimane Elves. And, you know, you can't add an Elder thing without also having, you know, uh, a horrible cult to worship it. So perhaps Codus is now exerting its will into the world through this cult called the Hand of Codus. Why would the members of the Hand of Codus serve this horrible Elder thing, giant hand that lives underneath a city? Well, uh, I have some ideas, but uh, let's just keep the momentum going. Let's come up with a couple of different kinds of monsters that would be flavorful and different that would only be found here in our terrible city underground. Monsters are not always, strictly speaking, factions, especially if they are not, like, you know, reasonable, intelligent people uh, with a will of their own, but it's fun to come up with monsters, so I'm gonna do it. 
the easiest kind of monster to put into a dungeon, a place where there is no light or resources coming in from the outside at all, are of course the undead. So let's have a bunch of the unconsecrated dead kind of fuse together to make these horrible spiders. And then let's say there's also sort of like a, a patrol of these undead Night's Watch that lead around like a gaggle of mad ghosts on chains called the Wraith Keepers. And you know, there's no reason we can't give our monsters desires too. Maybe the bone spiders want to be buried with honors, and maybe the wraith keepers want to have their contracts annulled. Like if we discover like where they wrote down their name that said that they would guard the city forever and we destroy that piece of parchment, uh, they can go free. So we've written out a couple of different factions to put down in our dungeon, but we need to decide how the rest of the world interacts with this dungeon. And rather than overthink it, I'm just going to say that there's a big old city that somebody built right over the top of what happened to be ancient slumbering Sentamanus. We'll just call this bustling city Felden, and we'll just cover it in all kinds of windmills and river mills and all that kind of stuff, and it's just a rich agricultural community um, that uh, brings in a lot of wealth for the kingdom. We'll add the two easiest faction to add to any metropolitan area, the law and the criminal element. So the law basically exists here to collect taxes from the landowners and farmers. So we'll just call them the coin guard and we will have a group of thieves. And we'll just say that in this city, if you are caught stealing anything, um, you, you're just the standard punishment is you get your hand chopped off. So all of these thieves are easy to recognize because they are all wearing prosthetic hooks in replacement of the hands that they lost to Johnny Law. Now that's pretty interesting. We have sort of like this spurned underclass that might be, you know, skulking around the Undercity and find a secret passageway into dreaded Sentimanus. And uh, that is how they would fall into contact with the terrible malign intelligence of Cotus and start a cult and all that kind of stuff. So let's just say that the, the hand of Cotus is an offshoot of our thieves. And that answers our big question for our factions. Why is this happening now? Why is the incursion of Cotus again plaguing the world? Well, it's because our thieves were digging around where they oughtn't to have been and have now tried to seize power to revolt against their oppressors. So as the Hand of Cotus begins its, you know, initiation rites and dark rituals and whatnot, rumors begin to spread of Sentimanus, and that brings other interested parties into this. Now, it should be said, at this point, we probably have enough factions. You probably only really want three, uh, especially if this is your first time GMing or if this is a brand new campaign. Um, but... Uh, I, I gotta be honest, it's not a fantasy setting unless you know what the dwarves and the elves are up to and what their opinions about everything is. If you find yourself in a similar situation and your notes start running away with you and you need something more than just an 8x10 sheet of paper with some pencils to keep track of your world, head on over to worldanvil.com. Unlike a stinky sheet of paper that stays in a dusty drawer, you can share your world building with your players over the glorious waves of the internet tubes. Add your players as co-authors and make them write down all of the bios and NPC names that they made you come up with on the spot. Sign up using promo code CROW and that will get you 40% off all new recurring memberships. And now, back to talking about dwarves. So let's just say that the dwarves of Clan Aros have memories even longer than their beards, and they have never forgotten that the elves of Sintamain hoard the conquered wealth of their clan. So they have come to Felden, far over misty mountains, cold to dungeons deep and caverns old, for they must away ere break of day to claim their long-forgotten gold. I am a sucker for the classics. And the elves of Aondel have also heard of the rumors of Sentimanus and have come in secret, not to reclaim, but to destroy. 
and it will be a truly regrettable cataclysm when the city of Felden is also destroyed. But, you know, this high price must be paid. The elves, after all, remember when their kin ruled the world with an iron fist. So one little town and some grain doesn't seem too high a price to pay for them. Now I know what you're thinking. Kyle, Kyle, you're screaming futilely into your screen right now. The elves are the good guys. Well, you may notice that no one here is the good guy. Everyone here just wants things that serve them for their own purposes. That's what factions are about. It's not about separating people along moral lines. That's the player's business. As a GM, you don't have to make those decisions. Will the players play a bunch of dwarves that are on a treasure hunt, or will they hire themselves out to help the dwarves? Will the players discover the secret plot of the elves and find some way to evacuate the city or stop them? Will the players rescue the greedy captain of the coin guard who has taken a detachment of men to go look for valuables and in so doing disturb a nest of bone spiders? And speaking of the bone spiders, will the players discover the disturbing origins of these tragic creatures and bring justice to them? These factions are not stories. They exist to give interesting and meaningful decisions for the players to mess around with. No, they're not stories. They're situations. And situations are way easier and faster to write and help serve emergent play and respond easily to player interaction. And if you know what each of your factions wants, and you know what happens if they do get what they want, well then, if your players decide to ignore this faction, you can have them running their own schemes in the background and become problems later on. Or, if your players aren't interested in talking to the coin guard ever, like, don't bring them in. They don't have to be part of the game. And you've wasted no time and effort basically preparing them. You've come up with a silly name and something they want to do with the central adventure location. So I think that just about does it for this episode. Thanks again to World Anvil for sponsoring us. And we will continue next week with another episode on our series on world building. If you have any questions about world building, or any topics that you would like me to cover in future episodes of Map Crow, please leave them in the comments below. If you want to hear some more thoughts on how to make an interesting cult for your game, uh, head on over to thesplatbook.com to listen to my podcast that I do with my friend John, where we talk about that very subject. Whew, this is too many plugs. Too many plugs! Uh, so I'm not even going to mention my Patreon campaign over at patreon.com slash mapcrow. Won't even do it. So until next time, my friends, farewell.